I do feel at home in this lineage, you know, because my teacher was Kala Rinpoche, and because we did mainly, um, we mainly did the, these practices in the three year in his three year retreat. I would say the majority of practices were Shangpa, Shangpa lineage, and so I feel like it's my lineage, if anything is. Um, and, uh, and one thing I. And I'm, I'm shamelessly only using my own book. I didn't even take notes <laughs> um, on Naguma because I did a you know, quick synopsis of the Shangpa practices in here as well as the translations of uh, uh, everything I could find by her. Um, and one thing I noticed I said, which you know, otherwise I'd probably have forgotten to ever say this, but um, the Shangpa Kargyu is called Shangpa Kargyu now. Um, not in so much as a subsect of the Kargyu, but as also a practice lineage. Um, and it's one of the specific lineages that Kongtrul Rinpoche mentioned that needed to be preserved. It was in danger of disappearing, and he specifically mentions Shangpa. And also because of, I spoke on the fir on Friday night, and you might not have been here, but of the close connection that Kongtrul had with Taranata and Kunga uh, Drolcho. And uh, that's the Jonang lineage, and the Jonang lineage is very close to the Shangpa lineage for a number of reasons, including sharing both Taranata and Jangan Kongtrul. Um, however, because of the activities of my teacher, Kala Rinpoche, uh, and his activity, and of course, Jamun Control and many others, but Kala Rinpoche, I think we, we could actually say that more people have done the retreat in the Shangpa tradition of the three year retreat than any other lineage on the planet. So thank you, Jamun Control, for preserving it, and um, Kala Rinpoche for ensuring that the practice, the, the actual practice, continued um, in such a way that it's really flourished, maybe not the studies so much. Um, so when I first met Kala Rinpoche, I, he said, well, not like when I first met him that day, but in general, in the early days, he, he, and he, he told us that you know, the Shangpa lineage had begun with women. And that was the source of the lineage, and it would also be the end, maybe <laughs> the ruination of it. I don't know if he, what he meant by that, but that at the end times, it would also be women. So that kind of interested me uh, all along, as you might have guessed by now. I've been interested in bringing forth the stories of women just because they were so absent in the Tibetan history. And certainly there were women there, but where were their histories? You know, where were their biographies? Where were their teachings. And so um, uh, the Shangpa lineage traces to two women, um, Niguma and Sukha City. They call Dakinis, of course, Dakini, wisdom Dakinis, or Dakinis of timeless awareness. You know, the woo. And um, so after I did work on the Machik, both Machik and Niguma seem to have left a, a good deal of material to work with. However, I discovered as I searched and searched and searched that she was very elusive, and that's why this is called Lady of Illusion, for many reasons. And the one text translated in here is called uh, The Stages of Illusion, Juma Lamrim, uh, which is sort of a wonderful almost poke at you know, the Mahayana stages of the path because she just kind of goes through all the Mahayana, the ten Bhumis and the five paths, and just kind of says, illusion, 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 illusion. You know, so it was kind of, it was okay, except for I would have rather not have to go through all the paths just in order to say they were illusion. That was a surprise. Um, Kongtrol says about um, the Shangpa that it's, uh, that there was um, also a lineage of teaching and explication um, and even philosophy um, and then practice that's at the beginning and that that has been lost. And all that remains are the practices. Um, so Shangpa has really been, um, as Rimshe always also used to say, not very widespread, but very deep. 
and the people practicing it are really practicing it. You know, they're in, uh, I, I actually was present with him one time when he received a letter from Tibet, and he didn't know what had happened to so many people after the Chinese invasion, and, and he received a letter from someone, and they had been hiding in a empty, like, trunk of, uh, you know, a tree that had been cut off, and there was hollow inside, and they were basically underground, this m one monk, practicing the Shangpa practices all the whole time, like for 20 years. And he finally got a letter. It was very moving to see him get that. He was, he was nearly in tears and so happy. Anyway, it became well known for its kind of deep level of practice. Um, so in our little chart you know, of the handout, um, the person sort of responsible, the charioteer, uh, who brought the teachings, it was a man called Chungpo Najur, the yogi of the Kyung or Garuda clan. And uh, um, reputed to have lived about 150 years. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not quite like Padam Vasange when we get to him, because that's more like 500 years. But still, 150 is pretty old. But um, and he, in a in a way, I mean, you hear about people starting in one lineage or another and ending up practicing the wonderful Nyingma teachings. In the case of Jumbo Nalger, he, he was very unsatisfied with both the Pun and Nyingma teachings. And so he went off with the explicit goal of meeting, you know, a, a manifestation of Vajradhara and getting direct teachings. And, uh, and that ended up being Niguma and then also Sukha City. Um, so it's a good story, and you can read about it in the book. And um, so who, who she was, who, I guess I shouldn't talk too much about Naguma because I'm talking about oh, Shankpa, please. but anyway, they're kind of interesting mm -hmm. people. Yeah. I can't help it. She uh, uh, is the only you know, person I've focused on a lot who's Indian, from India, and she's from Kashmir, and um, did a lot of research to prove at least try to prove that she was, in fact, Naropa's sister. And, and be, ever since Herbert Gunter, our forefather, m announced that it was his consort, and then even suggested it might be his consort and his sister, and, you know, all being all tantric and everything. Um, I don't think so. I, I have never met a Tibetan who thought so. Um, unlike Machik, that's another story. I've, I do have that. Uh, this is a little kind of, that's my chip on my shoulder that every great woman is always said to be an adjunct of some great man, like as if they can't be great on their own. I admit it. I'm confessing now. So I did a lot of research on their, both their hagiographies, and I found that another mistake that I believe that Gunter made in the Naropa, early Naropa biography that he translated was that Naropa is from a place called Bagalore, and he identified that with Bengal. Mm -hmm. So many people have assumed Naropa is a Bengali, and, mm -hmm. I, and, it, and it's just not, I found plenty of resources to the contrary, and that he was actually from Eastern, uh, Eastern India, which is Kashmir, where all kinds of fantastic things happen, and right now is like at war again. But um, Kashmir is a hot spot for sure of Tantra and everything. Um, so Chungpo Nalja going to India and meeting her in the graveyard, in the charnel ground, seeing her, I've very carefully looked at the, you know, description of the events, and it was basically, he was in an altered state, for sure, probably dreaming. Um, and all the other, besides Chungpo Naljur, all the other Neguma lineages are from men who came hundreds of years later and saw, remember we were talking about Daknang, pure, pure vision, who encountered Neguma in pure vision, like Tangtong Gyalpo, this is a very important in the lineage, Bodong Chogne Namgyal that I mentioned. Um, you know, all kinds of people sing Naguma. And I, the whole time I was translating this book, I was like, okay, I'm ready, where's Naguma? And shit, that didn't happen. So I had to translate it instead of just have a pure vision and then tell you all that I was a Tertan. Um, so let's see, okay, so Naguma and the older sister 
actually the oldest sister of Naropa, and I don't know if you're going to talk about Naropa at all, but um, the, his, their parents, you know, had Naguma first, and then that sort of a bummer in an Indian family, and they wanted a boy, of course, and they had to go and do special prayers and everything, and, and then came along Naropa. So my, so there's a very much of parallel in their teachings, um, and I, but my contention is, and this is totally off the cuff because I have no proof of this, that it was Naropa who got it from Naguma, because she's the older sister. You know how siblings and, you know, that works. So, but anyway, um, her, her, one of the main teachers of Sukha City and Naguma has been mentioned as Virupa, and we just heard about Virupa this morning in the Lamdre, different Virupa. This is, I just was thinking it would be like if all that was left of our civilization was our first names, how it would be when we, you know, someone tried to figure out who, you know, well, Sarah said blah, 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 you know, and there's like about thousands and thousands of Sarahs. So that's, you know, another Virupa that isn't quite clear, but it's not the same one as the Lamdre Virupa. Maybe it was a common Indian name, I don't know. But, and she developed, she, and then also um, Chungpu Nadra also encountered Sukha City, uh, who, who didn't leave really any, very few little, few lines of practice, but practice has developed based on that. So we get, for instance, um, for instance, like Mahamudra, which we're gonna talk about a lot when Elizabeth talks, but Mahamudra is also, there's Mahamudra in uh, the Shankpa lineage, it's called um, the ga gaoma, which means a, a relic, you know, an amulet box like they wear. And it was supposed to be because Chungpu Nalja held the teachings so dearly, he always wore them on the on his neck. And of course, there's the six yogas also. So there's Mahamudra and the six yogas. And there's Mahamudra and six yogas of Naguma, Mahamudra and six yogas of Sukha City, Mahamudra and six yogas of Naropa, and of course, Mahamudra is present in the Chur lineage and obviously in the Galupa lineage. And so there's a lot of the same teachings. And that parallel, I think, is another reason why Shankpa has been so closely associated with, uh, with the um, Kargyu, you know, the Marpa Kargyu lineage. Even though uh, there's very few crossovers, like the lineages are parallel, Naguma, you know, the, the siblings, Naguma and Naropa, but kind of coming down like this until, uh, there might have been a few crossovers back way when, but for sure, Jang and Kontro um, brings them together. I'd say wrong, well, I don't know, I won't say anything. Uh, so I don't want to go on about that. There's a little, uh, so I want to just briefly talk about the practices. Um, uh, the nundro, and we haven't really talked about preliminary practices or nundro, but it, it became somehow universal. I've never traced that specifically. Like, uh, it may have been Atisha, it may, you know, who first developed this idea, or who came up with the hundred thousand and everything. I've never really pinned that down. Um, it's not exact. <clears throat> excuse me. It's it's a, a unusual in the Shangpa tradition. It's different than either the Kargyu or the Nyingma or actually any of the others, for two, two things are different. If, you, if you're familiar with the preliminary practices, I think most of you are. There's no Vajrasattva practice. Uh, the purification practice is different. There is a purification practice, uh, um, but it's different. It has to do with the one syllable, ah. Uh. And, uh, and the other thing that's rather unusual that I really like is um, it's, it's a, there's no visualization of like Vajradhara, Buddha, or, you know, most of the other Nundras, you have, um, you have your guru, your Lama, in the form of either Vajradhara or Samantabhadra or Guru Rinpoche or somebody so that you have pure view, so you have a good outlook on who it, that person is. In the Shangpa, no, it's your, your, your guy, you know, it's your one. You visualize as they are. And I asked Kala Rinpoche about that once, you know, how do I visualize it? And he kind of got this very cute 
expression sparkly eyed and said, well, if you can have faith in an old man, you know, kind of thing. Um, so I always actually prefer that because I d did have faith, but uh, that was one thing that's different. And then there's a little mnemonic device type of thing so you can remember uh, the main teachings which are called the six golden dharmas. And of course I never do and that's why I have the book. doesn't work on me. Um, it's a picture of a tree. Sometimes I've even seen it drawn. Um, so they say um, the roots of the tree are the six dharmas, the six yogas, um, which is, of course, you're familiar with or will be familiar with soon, right? It's tumo and illusory body, dream, lucid clarity, transference, and the intermediate state practices. The trunk of the tree is this amulet mahamudra, a special mahamudra, uh, which is also called clear light mahamudra. That is a special name for it, or, or you know, lucid clarity mahamudra uh, that signifies that it's particular to the Shankpa lineage. Um, the flowers, I'm mean, sorry, the branches are something called the three integrations, um, which is to practice that all sights, sounds, and thoughts are the nature of the guru, the yidam, and illusion, respectful, you know, in, in, in that order. So all sights, are the nature of the guru, all sounds are the yidam, and all thoughts are the illusion, body, speech, and mind. So it's the integration of body, speech, and mind with pure outlook. Uh, then the flowers of the tree are white and red kachari. Um, these are Dakini deities, um, much like, or you know, forms of Vajrayogini. If, Vajrayogini. if we call Vajrayogini the sort of generic Dakini, these are two forms of her, a white and a red one. Um, and then the fruit is called, I call, I mean, I translate it as immortal and infallible. There's, those two came together by two different lineages and were brought together. Um, these are actually, I'm gonna, this is like the fruition of the practice, which is a, is a realization in a way, a little bit like a Madhyamaka kind of, you know, realization of emptiness, of realizing that the mind or watching the mind to see if you can find its, its birthplace, you know, the moment where it came into being. And, um, you know, hint, hint, you don't find it. And then you realize, well, if it wasn't born, how, how are you, how's it gonna die? You know, if it can't be born, it's not gonna die. Um, which is a level of realization that's a, on the fruitional level. And then the body is easy, right? Because that's, that's uh, just a bunch of material. So obviously that's um, the immortal part because it, it wasn't, it, it, you know, it wasn't a real thing in itself. So those are the six golden dharmas that uh, are kind of famous of the glorious Shangpa. Um, then there's... As I mentioned, there's the six dharmas of Sukha Siddhi as well. There's other practices, the five tantric deities, the five, or actually, that's not right, it's the five tantras <laughs> deities. Shangpa is like, everything is shortened. It's like super, you know, easy. I mean, not easy, but simplified. So instead of practicing all kinds of tantric deities, you just practice five of them all at once in your five chakras. And they're all there, you know, Hevajra, Chakrasambhara, everybody, Mahamaya. Um, and then you, you get that over with. And then uh, there's, Chakrasambhara is big in, in the lineage, so there's a five deities of Chakrasambhara, different, much more simpler than the Chakrasambhara you may, some of you may be familiar with, the Kargyu, the Marpa Kargyu Chakrasambhara. And then there's the four deities combined. Um, it's another one. It's like all your favorites in one practice. So there's six are Mahakala, Vajrayogini, Avalokiteshvara, and Green Tara, and as well, one's guru as Vajradhara. So that's five actually all at once. Get it all out of the way. You only have to do like 100,000 or something. So um, these are all pretty nice. And uh, the six, even the like the yogic, physical practices that you do, the, the physical yogas that you do in connection with the six yogas, which, you know, in Tibetan yoga is a mind practice. It's not necessarily uh, jumping up and down doing stuff. But, um, 
but there are exercises that go along with it. And they're vastly simplified from the Naropas one because we had to do them all. We did all of the Naropa ones, all of the Nguma ones, and all of the Sukha City ones, uh, all the same thing. Um, so we did the, um, 18 yo <laughs> the 18 yogas. I have to write a new book. The 18 yogas and start a new number. And uh, then the protector for the lineage is the six arm Mahakala, which is a manifestation of Avalokiteshvara, unlike the other Mahakalas. Protectors, are, that's a whole other story that we haven't talked about. But the six arm Mahakala is really regarded as Avalokiteshvara. Uh, six arm Mahakala is also a protector in the Galupa lineage, but that one has its knee raised. And the Shankpa one just has its foot up. So it's a totally different thing. And, um, and then there's one last practice that I'll mention before I turn it over, um, which is something called um, the uncommon or extraordinary shamatha and vipassana and mahamudra. And that was kept very, very secret uh, for a long, long, long time until this, our generation when Kala Rinpoche decided and I found out this later, of course, that he decided, okay, time for that to be revealed. And he started teaching mm -hmm. first the uncommon shamatha, which is a very kind of tantric shamatha, I would say, with visualizations and stuff, and then the uncommon vipassana or a penetrating insight. So calm abiding, uncommon in this one. And then the, he never did do the Mahamudra. He had said he would see if people were advancing on these first two so I guess that didn't happen. Um, but those are extraordinary teachings too. Um, I forgot to mention that like the Lamdre teachings, um, there was a, what's called a one-to-one -one lineage. It wasn't that it was, you know, the, the Lamdre is more astonishing that it lasted so long as an oral teaching and never written down. The Shangpa, lineage from Chungpo Naljur, he came back and then I guess Naguma put a sort of in his vision, put a seal on it to not spread it to anybody. So it was actually seven generations of a one-to-one -one guru to disciple down until it was finally, um, you know, presented um, to people. On a, and then there was a lot of people. So, so that's the story of this lineage that nearly kind of faded out, but uh, or went underground, literally under you know under the tree trunk kind of thing for many years until Kala Rinpoche and Jong based on Jongun control um, um, revived it. I would you know and just because he personally was a very extraordinary person, he gathered many many disciples and also not just in the West the other lamas. I mean the Dalai Lama, the even Dingo Kensei Rinpoche. They all exchanged their empowerments and teachings and things. So he, so that there's any number of the lamas who you've heard about now have the Shangpa lineage. Um, they hold it. Sita Rinpoche is one of the main holders. Tenga Rinpoche started teaching it exclusively. Um, you know, so. Uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a kind of an amazing survival story. Yeah, so that's all. And now I want to um, turn it over to my friend and colleague <laughs> and great you, translator. <laughs> do you want to give people a chance to ask questions um, about this? Do you want to do that or wait till the end? We can wait till the well, end. If they're about this. Would, oh, is okay. It good? Well, sure. Just sometimes I get to, then I might, then I might go on a tangent. <sighs> That would be fun. I know, it would be terrible. <laughs> okay, there's no questions. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. So I'm talking about the Marpa Kaju. And I might do this a little bit differently than Sarah's been doing it because I also had an understanding of it being um, more general. So since it's being recorded, so going beyond this room. So I know, you know, many of you here are very, very familiar with Marpa Kaju. And so a lot of what I'm gonna say is things that you know inside out. But I am gonna try and do a, 
sort of a concise overview of what we, what we mean when we say Marpa Kaju. So a lot of us these days when we hear Kaju, we think um, about Kaju teachers we know, and they all are, many of them, most of them that probably you all are encountering, encountering are Karma Kaju. So we're actually going back before Karma Kaju to Marpa Kaju. So what is this Marpa Kaju that Jamgun Control uh, said was one of the um, eight practice lineages that's written about in Esoteric Instructions in the Treasury of Knowledge in that particular volume 6-4, right? No, 8-4, 8-4, 8-4. So those teachings and then in his Treasury of Precious Instructions are four volumes on Marpa Kaju teachings. So what is this Marpa Kaju? So obviously Marpa Kaju is named for the 11th century translator and teacher, Marpa Chiji Lodru, who brought a collection of teachings to Tibet that he gathered during three trips to India. When Marpa was going to India from Tibet, he and many other Tibetans. Um, what they were encountering in India were basically Buddhism in two modes. There were the great monastic universities like Nalanda and Vikramalashila, where Panditas were teaching on you know, the sort of standard topics that are studied in monastic colleges philosophy, epistemology, linguistics, and they were debating and they were meditating. But these were also Mahayana universities, and at that time, Vajrayana was also being studied, maybe being practiced, I don't know, but it was, <laughs> <laughs> it was being studied and there were many um, commentaries being written on Vajrayana also in that context. At the same time, there were also those who either stepped out of that context for their practice, or they never joined to begin with. And so this was the yogins and yoginis who were practicing pith instructions and gained their experiences and realizations without necessarily having a lot of study, being done a lot themselves, or had a lot of um, explanation or scholastic knowledge. However, there were some who were great panditas who then chose to follow this non-monastic, non-institutional path. And these are what we call siddhas, accomplished ones. And some of them were even mahasiddhas, great accomplished ones. And we know about them mainly from the collection of the tales of the 84 Mahasiddhas that were written down in the 12th century by Abhaya Datta and has been translated into English. So we're mostly everybody's familiar with these stories. So going back to Marpa, this was the India he was going to. So when he was young, he did start to study, um, or wished to start to study Buddhism when in Tibet, and he studied with Drogmi Lotsawa, um, who at that time, who at that time was very strict about his teachings, and Marpa was unable to get a lot of teachings from him, um, possibly because he wasn't making enough offerings. <laughs> so he studied Sans Sanskrit for three years. And then he looked at his situation and realized he would need even more offerings to get any more teachings, and he decided he would go to India. So off he went. And when Marpa was in India, I'm going to do a little bit of a, a you know, summation so we can kind of move through this lineage. Um, but um, Marpa's uh, life story has been translated into English. It's out there. It's very interesting, loads of fun. It, you should definitely read it if you haven't already. Marpa trained with five main teachers, um, but it's said that he had a total of 13 teachers. The primary ones were um, Naropa and Maitrepa. And those are the, I'm going to focus on the primary 
um, teachers and their students to trace this lineage down. Um, when Marpa met Naropa, Naropa was a Mahasiddha. But he had trained for a long time in the monastic universities, and he had been the northern gatekeeper at Nalanda and Bikramalashila, either both or one or the other. However, he, at a certain point, as many of you know the story, he had a vision of a Dakini who was testing his knowledge and to see if he had true realization, if he understood anything more than the words. Did he understand the meaning? And honestly, he didn't understand the meaning, so she urged him to go off and find the teacher who could show him the meaning, which was Tilopa. Tilopa has an even more unconventional story than Naropa. Tilopa was probably lived in Bengal, and there are different accounts of his life. Some, well, the most, most of them say that he trained as um, a monastic, meditating for 12 years, bound in iron chains. And then following a vision of his teacher, his urged him to go off and practice in a different way. He practiced mi mixing meditation with his, with daily life. And so during the day he pounded sesame seeds and at night he served a prostitute. And after practicing in this way for 12 years, he gained ultimate realization. And then he wandered off and was very unconventional. And that's who Naropa sought out. And both Tilopa and Naropa's life stories are translated into English, so you can read about them. Um, I have more fun with that. Tilopa is famous for saying that he had no human teachers, that his teacher was Vajradhara, the primordial Buddha. On the other hand, there are accounts of him having received either four or six what we call in English special transmissions or kabap, kabap shi or kabap druk from four teachers, human teachers. And the accounts of these, of who the teachers um, were and what he received do differ. Um, <coughs> not all that much, but they do. And the one I'm going to give here is the one that Jamgun Kontrol presents in um, his Treasury of Knowledge. Buddha, Buddhism's journey to Tibet, but there are other ones. The four um, teachers and what he received were from Krishnacharya, he received Chandali instructions, from Nagarjuna, illusory form or illusory body and luminosity, from Lawapa, dream yoga, and from Sukha Siddhi, Poa or transference, and Bardo or intermediate state instructions. So these four special transmissions make up the four root or dharmas or six dharmas that Naropa received from Tilopa. And Tilopa was al also passed on to him Mahamudra instructions. So back to Naropa, when he met Tilopa, Tilopa subjected him to 12 major and 12 minor hardships. Um, at the end of each one of those hardships, he received an instruction and gained more realization. And then finally, according to some accounts anyway, with the slap of a sandal on his face, he attained complete awakening or full realization. <laughs> And then he went off and he lived um, at Pulahari in north central India, um, and that's where Marpa found him. So, mainly from Naropa, but also from his other gurus, Marpa received Vajrayana teachings and empowerments. Hey Vajra, Guya Samaya, Mahamaya, and Chakra Sambara, the main ones. And Marpa received. Mahamudra instructions. So these are from Tilopa, Naropa, Marpa. Marpa also received Mahamudra instructions from Maitripa, who also had been a Pandita and was a student of the wandering uh, yogin Shaoripa, who was a student of Saraha. So Marpa received Mahamudra instructions from Maitripa, which then 
came from Shawaripa and Saraha. So this is then two streams of Mahamudra instructions that Marpa received, among many others, but just try and keep a simple line. Um, and many of you may have heard of um, the great Brahman Saraha, who um, instructions have been preserved in his dohas, or simplicity's sake, you could say songs. There's a trilogy of song to the king, or doha to the king, doha to the queen, doha to the people, or masses. These have also been, and other ones, and these have been translated as well. So during this period when Marpa was traveling to India, where he spent um, a total of 21 years, he also lived as a householder, and he was married with children. And so, there, as I said, there are many great stories about both his time in India and Tibet. Um, he was a colorful person in a colorful time. But to keep again to the essentials, he had four main students, she called the four pillars, to whom he entrusted his main transmissions. And the one to carry his practice lineage was Milarepa. And his teaching or explanatory transmission was transmitted to the other three students. The most well-known of those is Ngok Chukudorje, Dorje, whose special transmission was that of the He Vajra Tantra and the all the explanations of that. Um, and the other two were certain Wangye and Metun Sumpo. But the one we're concerned with now in this transmission of, of Marpa Kaju, at this point, to use Sarah's analogy of hourglass. 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 So Marpa is that point. So he has the, te he came back to Tibet with the um, after his, you know, his three trips to India with all the teachings he's re he received, and then he started teaching to his various students the Vajrayana and the Mahamudra instructions. And so, of course, there were many, he had many students, and during that, uh, during his time, they had many students. And so, there are many teachings that we don't have these days, writings, um, practices. But his main transmitter was Milarepa, the, probably the most famous of all Tibetans, Tibetan practitioners, you know, the yogi, they call him the yogi saint, you know, he's the hermit who lived in the mountains. And so his, his um, Biography and his collection of 100,000 songs has also been translated into English almost 40 years ago. So if you haven't read those, you should read them if you're interested in this, in this lineage um, and in these teachings. So, so many of you and probably everyone here in the room knows his story, but briefly. When he was young to avenge his family enemies, he, he practiced black magic and he killed many people then feeling greatly remorseful and concerned about the consequences of his evil karma, he set out to practice the Dharma. And his connection was with Marpa Lotsawa, who, when he went to meet him, at first would not give him any teachings, and he had to undergo many hardships. Then finally, he did receive teachings, and he went off and spent the rest of his life living in mountains, sometimes um, on his own, and sometimes with students around him. He was a very inspiring person, and he had many uh, students, but the two most famous ones are Re Chungpa and Gampopa. And in our transmission of, of Marpa Kaju teachings, Gampopa is the more central teacher of those two, but there are many teachings from Re Chungpa, which um, we do have in Tibetan, and they have been preserved, and some of them are contained in Jungan Kontrol's Treasury of Precious Instructions. And so when that gets translated, you can read them. You may also be familiar with Gampopa. So Gampopa was a monk 
who trained in the Kadampa tradition, as Sarah explained this morning, and so you know something about that. Um, and it is said that Gampopa taught his regular disciples or students a graduated path of the Kadampa and a sutra-based Mahamudra path. And that to his special disciples, he taught the uncommon Mahamudra of secret mantra and, and the other Vajrayana teachings that he had received from Milarepa. So we'll come back to that, that point. One of the most well-known texts of Gampopa's uh, in English is his Jewel Ornament of Liberation, also translated um, again uh, under the title of Ornament of Precious Liberation. And this is a stages of the path um, or stages of the teachings text, which Sarah also talked about this morning, which came from the Kadampa tradition. It's one of the hallmarks of Kadampa literature is the stages of the path or stages of the teachings. It's an um, example of that. Excuse me. So now we're up to about the first part of the 12th century. So that was when Gampopa was actively teaching. Gampopa had a lot of students too. And these students were more active in creating lineages than previous generations of students in this transmission. So Marpa, Mila, Gampopa. Since um, Gampopa's teaching seat was at Dakpo, it's a place, this is also called the Dakpo Kaju. So Marpa Kaju and Dakpo Kaju, you could say, um, probably referring to the same set of teachings, although maybe not what you know came from Ngok, Ngok Choko Dorje, or Ray Chungpa might wouldn't be necessarily Dakpo Kaju, possibly mm -hmm. going to be very mm -hmm. split your hairs, but <laughs> Gampopa had four main students, and of them there are two who were ma who whose lineages became major um, Kaju lineages, and one is. The, the Dusam Chempa, who was later considered the first Karmapa, and that is the Karma Kaju. And the other major, um, the other student who was incredibly um, inspiring to people was Pamodrupa. And the other of the of these four were um, Barompa, Dharma Wangchuk, and Shang Rinpoche. Their lineages have not continued down to the present day in a, in a very um, discreet and strong form. But we have Karma Kaju and then Pamodrupa. And Pamodrupa had eight students who were very active um, and charismatic teachers and had lineages go on from their teachings. And of, I'm not going to list all eight, but um, because I want you to remember something. And <laughs> I tell you all eight and six of them we, we don't really hear about these days. So just the two that we do. And it's the Drukpa Kaju and Drigon Kaju. So Drukpa Kaju was started by Ling Repa, who is a student of Pamo Drupa. And after Ling Repa comes in this lineage is Sangpa Jari, Good Sangpa, um, and there are many others, Yang Gompa, many other great teachers. That, and this has been a very strong lineage which comes down to us um, today as um, a discrete um, Marpa Kaju lineage, not Karma Kaju. And the same with Drigung Kaju, also very strong, was started by uh, Jikten Sungong, and also it's a strong transmission um, which comes down to us today. And now to turn to the teachings that uh, Marpa brought to Tibet and transmitted. And we can say that they're generally characterized as either being path of method or path of liberation. And just um, 
sort of footnote about categories. As Sarah made this very clear this morning um, about how, and yet, and last night too, how Tibetans received um, such a great wealth of teachings from India and then worked on organizing them and categorizing them. And these category, categories are not um, like rigid, fixed barriers. They're just a way to talk about, um, uh, give yourself a framework or give yourself like a way, a get, way to get a handle on it. So I don't know that Marpa said that his teachings fell into these two categories. Mm -hmm path of method or path of liberation. Um, we've only recently had access to the collected works of Marpa. And maybe one day I will search through there and see if he did say that, but chances are he didn't. It's, but this is what, um, that's the, but this is the sort of uh, general division that Jamgun Konsul uses in his Treasury of Knowledge and the esoteric instructions when he talks about Marpa Kaju. And it's actually, I think, a very helpful way to think about this. Um, but it, it shouldn't imply that you, that someone might only do one or the other. In fact, quite the opposite, generally. But, so path of method. So, Path of method is the Vajrayana generation and completion stage or process practices. The generation stage or process is meditation on a yidam using conceptually based visualizations, mantra recitations, nowadays embodied in sadhanas. And completion stage or completion process practices are meditation techniques based on or utilizing the subtle body breathing techniques, visualizations, and meditative experiences. These completion process or stage practices being the second phase of path of method um, in the teachings that Marpa received are called the six dharmas of Naropa. And if this is helpful, good. If not, just forget it. Um, they are also sometimes called a profound generation stage or an unprofound completion stage. And I'll come back to them and talk about them after. Um, look at the path of liberation. And this is called the Mahamudra teachings. So just a word about the term Mahamudra. It's used in two different ways. One is it's a name given to the ultimate, and there are lots of synonyms. So you could say Dharmakaya, highest wisdom, Dharmata, ultimate suchness. That's Mahamudra. It's the object of our realization. And then there are the instructions on how to realize it. And we shouldn't mix these two up. So when we hear Mahamudra, it does not only mean a graduated path to realizing the nature of your mind. Actually, that's the giving the name of the result to the cause. So actually Mahamudra is the nature of mind, which is beyond, you know, the usual beyond words, beyond thought. So from that point of view, and it's, um, as the ultimate or object of realization, Mahamudra is divided into ground path and fruition. And as ground, it's naturally luminous emptiness, the primordial state of our own mind, clear, brilliant, unidentifiable, and yet it is obscured now. So then we have path Mahamudra, and that's the practices that we're often very familiar with um, when we think about practicing Mahamudra. It's Shamatha and Vipassana, 
or it can be the practices of four mudras, karma mudra, samaya mudra, jnana mudra, and dharma mudra. And fruition mahamudra is, once we're familiar with or habituated to ground mahamudra through practicing the path, and all our obscurations are purified, wisdom, our Buddha nature, manifests. It's, fruition mahamudra is the blending of ground mahamudra and path mahamudra. But then if we turn to mahamudra as a path, which is really what most of us who are practitioners will engage with, um, we sometimes wonder, so how does this fit into the various types of paths there are? And going back to Gampopa, he said in a record of his teachings to Dusan Champa that Mahamudra is as a path is separate from sutra and mantra. So he designates it as a third path, saying it's a short path for those of highest abilities. So he, he in, these, uh, in this record of his conversation with Dusam Champa, the first Karmapa, he says there are three types of paths. One that uses inferential cognition, analysis, and reasoning. One that uses blessings, meditating on deities, and training with channels, winds, and bindus, and one that uses direct cognition as the path, and that is Mahamudra. So he sets it apart as a separate path, using direct cognition of the natural or intrinsic state of mind. In contrast to the path of Paramitayana, which he says is for those of lower abilities who practice mainly through faith and gathering the accumulations of merit and wisdom. And the Vajrayana, which is for those of intermediate abilities who have lots of concepts and mental afflictions. But as time went on in the Kaju traditions, teachers incorporated many practices from the sutras and from the Vajrayana, bringing in Abhishekas, preliminary practices, enhancement practices, such that this Mahamudra path in the Kaju, Dakpo Kaju tradition became blended with sutra and mantra, like a crossover path. And that was the case by about the 16th century when um, someone called Dakpo Tashi Namjal wrote a very large a treatise on Mahamudra practice or Mahamudra in general um, called Moonbeams of Mahamudra, which is my current translation project, so it's probably why I'm quoting from it. And then later on, in more recent times, Jongun Kontrol Lodru Tai in his Treasury of Knowledge in Esoteric Instructions um, said that there are three ways to practice Mahamudra. Sutra Mahamudra, Mantra Mahamudra, and it's called Essence Mahamudra. The most commonly of those three that we practice would be the Sutra Mahamudra. So I'm going to talk about it a little bit more. So look at how this has developed. And Sutra style Mahamudra, and this I'm um, mainly taking from Jamgun Kontrol's esoteric instructions. It begins with the traditional preliminary practices of refuge, bodhicitta, accumulations, purification, um, guru yoga, and is followed by the pointing out instructions given by a teacher to introduce the student to the nature of her or his mind. And once that's happened, then there is the rest of the path of cultivating that recognition and bringing it out further, experiencing it more, stabilizing it as a realization until it's fully stabilized and you're a fully awakened Buddha. So everything on the path is a support uh, for recognition and, to, and a means for bringing it about. So all the practices of shamatha and vipassana 
are that. Shamatha is calm abiding. It's a way of concentrating the mind so that it's our mind's intrinsic wisdom is apparent. And then in, through Vipassana, we hone that. And all of the various Mahamudra instructions that you can find in texts um, are there for that purpose. If you get it through the pointing out instructions alone, you, you're fine. You don't need to do anything more. And that pointing out instruction doesn't have to be very long. It could be a glance. It could be a single word. It could be sitting in a teacher's presence. Or it could be them actually saying something. But if you don't, then there are a wealth of techniques that have been passed on orally through this lineage and added to in all the generations and then written down in more organized manuals. Marpa himself did not probably write all that much. As I said, we just recently have access to his collected works. Milarepa we know mainly through his 100,000 songs. Gampopa has quite a large collected works, which a tiny bit, tiny bit has been translated into English. And his students were very prolific. And the Pamodrupa has a quite large collected works. Gutsangpa has a quite large collected works. And in all of these are their instructions. And then as time went on, there were even more instructions that were added, and those instructions were organized and collected into different manuals in a way that's possibly easier to use by many of the um, great 16th century uh, karma kaju, dakbo kaju, drukpa kaju, drigun kaju masters. And one example of that is Dakpo Tashi Namjal's Moonbeams of Mahamudra, which draws on Gampopa's teachings, um, you know, Saraha, Tilopa, um, and also I believe many of the other students of um, Gampopa, Pamodrupa, and their students, and put this all together and organizes it very nicely for us with headings and, you know, then there was the um, ninth Karmapa who did a very similar thing with his um, Ocean of Definitive Meaning, another Mahamudra text, which in a sense is even more of a practice manual and gives you exercises to do. So all of those are means for realizing Mahamudra, but them, they're a path. And in some of the other lineages, there are different styles. In the Drukpa Kaju, they're famous for the six cycles of equal taste, the Drigun Kaju for fivefold Mahamudra. Um, you also find in the Mahamudra teachings um, that the path is described in terms of four yogas one pointedness, uh, freedom from elaborations, also sometimes translated as simplicity one taste in non-meditation. And Dakpo Tashi Namjal says that this is one of the special features of the Dakpo Kaju, and that the names and subjects of the four yogas are found in earlier works, in sutras and in tantras, and in some of Atisha's teachings, but that they are primarily a dharma of realization of Gampopa. And this is one of the things that were pre was preserved in a little bit in Gampopa's own, um, in the records of Gampopa's own teachings, but more by his students, and then is also found um, in later works. So I want to end the, this little bit on Mahamudra instructions with um, two lines of verse on the six ways of resting from Tilopa. So to go back to our source, do not reflect, do not think, do not speculate. 
Do not meditate, do not analyze, rest naturally. So if you can do, do that, that's it. And then you don't need 500 pages of text. And now to turn to the path of um, method, of Vajrayana, that comes from Marpa. So in general, as I said, Vajrayana practice is said to have two phases, the generation and the completion phases. And so the generation phase is, is primarily, or to start with, about transforming our concepts, transforming our impure view, cultivating our inherent Buddha nature, and developing concentration through a series of rituals, visualizations, and mantra recitations. And in the Marpa Kaju traditions, the primary yidam or deity meditation practices are those of Vajrayogini, Chakrasambhara, Hevajra, and a few others. And completion, or sometimes translated perfection, stage, or process, are, as I said, they're techniques of visualization, posture, breathing, and mental concentration that work with the channels, winds, and bindus of the subtle body to induce realization of Mahamudra, our true nature. And these are presented to us in the form of the instructions that Naropa received from Tilopa, the six dharmas of Naropa, the four root dharmas, um, going back to the instructions that Tilopa received from four teachers that I mentioned, Krishnacharya, Nagarjuna, and so on. And the four root dharmas are the first four dharmas, so Chandali, illusory body, uh, luminosity, dream and luminosity. And these are said to be um, methods for transforming our delusion or ignorance that we experience during um, the four states that we all experience in our lives. So the first of these chandali is to transform the delusion we experience during sexual union. Illusory form transforms the delusion we experience during our waking state, dream, obviously, transform our dream state. And the instructions on luminosity are to transform the delusion or unknowing that we experience during deep sleep. There are also physical exercises in Tibetan Trulkor or Trungkor or Yantra um, and breathing exercises that accompany the Chandali practices. And these are like what Sarah was saying for the um, six dharmas or six yogas of Naguma and Sukha City. They also have their Trulkor or exercises. We have those for um, the six dharmas of Naropa. And they are a um, series of physical exercises that are, are combined with um, visualizations and one's own meditative experiences and they are to enhance one's experience and realization. So as we all know, Vajrayana path begins with receiving abhisheka or empowerments, and these can be extensive or simple, public or private. And then there's a graduated, the graduated instructions for deity meditation, generation stage practice, um, and possibly depending on the teacher and the circumstances, these will be followed by the completion stage practices. However, these two are a package. They actually do go together, and one is, from one point of view, a preparation for the other. Um, from another point of view, they just do fit together. So you train in one in order to be able to then use the other methods. So then the same way that shamatha and vipassana fit together, 
You could gain full realization through shamatha instructions. But if you don't, uh, they also then serve as a training for what will then you'll be able to enhance more through vipassana. So in the same way, generation stage practices and completion stage go together. So you, these days, particularly I will speak for karma kaju because that's what I know best or really all that I know. Um, the great deal of emphasis and focus on generation stage practice without necessarily be, there being the progression on to the completion stage practices which will complement them and may bring out things that are harder to bring out otherwise. Um, in the Karma Kaju tradition, it's become more, more common to give these instructions in the context of the three-year retreat, but it is not uncommon that teachers give them when their students are ready um, and outside of retreat. And this brings me to another topic which I did want to touch on here um, just a little bit, and that is um, the relationship with the teacher. Because one of the other special transmissions or kabap of the kaju tradition is said to be mugu, which is commonly translated as devotion. There are other ways that we could try to describe this, mugu, and I didn't do an exhaustive search of everybody else's translations, but you know, a sampling is egoless longing, um, one humility, Trollok Rinpoche has been translating mugu as humility, and could say it's deep appreciation that develops out of long, at, mm, not necessarily long term, deep appreciation that develops out of very dedicated apprenticeship. So just generally speaking, the experience of devotion differs between cultures and individuals, and it should grow naturally out of a relationship with the teacher However, it, ha it can become an issue of a lot of misunderstanding and pain. So it's worth mentioning that both teachers and students both need to have certain qualities, obviously starting with the basics of bodhicitta and compassion, uh, some quite a lot of intelligence, and a certain amount of training. And this training doesn't necessarily mean completing a requisite period of study and meditation. Uh, w someone may be the right teacher without having done a lot of formal study or even gone through in the Karma Kaju tradition a three year retreat, and yet they have the ability to be a real teacher to certain individuals. And others may go through that kind of formal training, but that's not how they're able to transmit. So I think we need to understand there are different types of teachers or gurus or lamas, and that this special relationship that we hear about, we read about in this lineage of Marpa Kaju coming from Tilopa to Naropa, from Naropa to Marpa, Marpa to Mila, is just that. It's special. That's why this is a special transmission of devotion. And it may require a lot of previous study and practice on a person's part to be able to get to that point where they can form that special relationship. Naropa studied for a very long time and was a very learned pandita before he even had the idea to go off and look for this special person, Tilopa. And then it took him a long time to find him, and he had a lot of troubles with him, 12 
grade and 12 minor hardships and all of that. And the same thing with Marpa. He underwent a great deal of difficulties to go see Naropa and all of this. But when that special relationship is there, we call that teacher our root guru because they are the one who can show us the nature of our own mind. And this has happened in this lineage, this transmission throughout the centuries, in every generation. And this transmission of teachings are mind-based, they're experiential, hard to capture in words. They transform the recipient and for that, that person feels very grateful. And that maybe is what you could say is devotion. And along the way, the people have lots of other teachers. And these teachers are mentors, instructors, preceptors, bestowers of Abhisheka, and so on. And it's why I mentioned to begin with that Marpa had five main teachers, but a total of 13 teachers. And Chungpul Naljur had? 150. <laughs> or maybe 140. <laughs> yeah. So all of the teachers are valuable, worthy, and necessary. But it might not be that every one is able to form that relationship of a root guru with them but that's also part of the path. So to wrap this up, um, I'm saying what you have realized by this point, that all practice lineages of Tibet have the same qualities and the same aim, just slightly different sets of teachings and styles of teachings. And these differences are determined by the individuals that brought teachings to Tibet. So. Um, in the case of Marpa Kaju, I think what many of us present-day practitioners um, experience is this wealth of pithy instructions which inspire us and intrigue us. And they were brought back to Tibet by this 11th century guy, Marpa, who was this very tough, strong-minded, deeply determined person who never gave up. There was one tale of when he was coming back on the first time from India, the collection of books of all these teachings that he had worked very, very hard to collect and gone around and received and was carrying them back. And he had a traveling companion who was uh, very jealous and competitive and who threw all his books into the river and he lost them all. And you can imagine, of course, that that first moment he was very heartbroken and then he realized that he had all the teachings in his mind. Yeah. But he did go back to India two more times. And each time he had to collect a lot of gold currency, right, to go. It wasn't easy. And he went on a road trip with no maps. And when he was at home, he had a wife and sons and many disciples. And yet even his neighbors wondered at times whether he had any realization. So I think, you know, we can see that Marpa demonstrated how even a seemingly ordinary person can make a huge contribution and each subsequent generation has done so. So we have Milarepa, who is this most famous yogi who lived in caves we have Gampopa, who combined the stream of Kadampa um, teachings with what he received from uh, Milarepa. And he brought structure and form to the transmission of Mahamudra instructions by writing things such as his Jewel Ornament of Liberation, by talking about Mahamudra as a path, as a path separate from sutra and mantra. Um, and on down, we have throughout this lineage many committed um, practitioners, some who are primarily meditators, and many who combined 
their sc- combine their meditation practice with um, scholastic study. Um, but what primarily stands out is to me is that it's an active dynamic transmission of the experiences and realizations of the nature of mind. Would you like to add anything? Oh, no. It's perfect. <laughs> well, it's a simple, in a way, a simple overview. And any point, you could pick up any point and explore it further, or any of the teachers and explore what they taught further. Um, anyway, do we have any contributions or? Questions? Thank you. Um, both of you talked about what they call Gila Niyajas with the yoga. And I was just curious uh, if actually indeed uh, Hatha yoga is, or you know, physical yoga is included as part of these traditions as well. Or recommended? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I do want to add that it's really nothing like what we know now as Hatha Yoga. Uh, okay. It's not all gentle and nice and stretchy and, you know, I, for instance, someone in my three retreat broke their, you know, broke their ankle doing it. It's much tougher than, I mean, I don't know enough about yoga in India to say the, about the origins, but what we have now is hatha yoga in like every mall, little mini mall and things. Definitely a lot like my experience of Tibetan yoga. So they have their own instructions for that. Yeah. Well, yeah, maybe you could say a little bit more than this, yes. (laughs) Um, One of the, as I said, the exercise, the the physical exercises, we, these days we call yogas, you're calling yoga, we call it trulkor, and we typically keep the Tibetan word, because um, the Sanskrit for it is not yoga or naljor, so I believe it's yantra, um, are, co- are connected very specifically to a certain type of meditation practice or meditation technique called Chandali, and they're used as enhancement practices for that. And so in our Buddhist tradition, our Tibetan Buddhist tradition, that practice, which has um, a corollary in, for simplistic terms, Hindu traditions as Kundalini, in the Buddhist path, that comes later. We do not start people with that type of um, meditation practice. And um, just for one, I would say, I think that, um, I think that the way it is done in the Buddhist traditions is quite good. It's just my personal opinion. I mean, I'm a Buddhist, you know, (laughs) don't know, I might, I could have a different opinion. I think it's actually quite good because we use these meditation techniques as enhancement. So we have a very strong foundation before we start to use those types of techniques. So this is why, and those techniques have a, have the physical exercise component, but they're n- not taught um, in another context. So they only come when you, if you use, if you get to that point. And the reason for this is because there's this, the reason we do this in the Buddhist tradition is because um, the aim of the practice is, is to realize the nature of your mind. I said that probably 10 times now. Um, everything else is just entertainment and distraction one way. And whatever types of experiences you might generate along the way, if they don't help you do that, they are distraction. And so any techniques that you might use, they should help you do that. But these are very powerful techniques, so they can also help you have all kinds of wonderful experiences, visionary, blissful, whatever. And if you do not have a stable foundation um, and understand 
the nature of your mind and that all these things are empty too, you can become even more distracted by them. So that's why it's, um, it's a graduated path, and so they come much later. I hope this is making some sense of it all. Um, but in recent years, and, and um, I've done a little, I've done, there isn't, it's hard to do this kind of research, and I haven't put a, a huge amount of time into it. I don't even know how I would do it. If, but um, the exercises are, did come out of India, they um, may, there may be correlations in um, the non-Buddhist yogic traditions for these exercises. These may be a particular set that there are also others that went along with them and that, that are simpler and more accessible for beginners. And those may be part of what we see nowadays as Hatha yoga. This is a very long time period we're talking about. This is, so we're going back, you know, 10th century, India, Mahasiddhas, what they were doing, and what Tilopa, you know, and Naropa passed, got passed on to Marpa. That's what we're getting in Tibet. So it's coming to us now of the yoga traditions of India. It's a whole different thing. It has a different history and has to be looked into. And um, there are some people doing that kind of research, um, but so I can't give a complete. But the reason I want someone to say that is there all is that there is also some. You know, there are teachers in Kaju lineages I know who are also teaching some forms of um, simple what we'd call yoga, hatha yoga, or physical exercises to again help us uh, stabilize our meditation. Enhance our meditation. Uh, my own teacher, Kempo Sultram Jamsramshe, did it in order to help us also start to practice meditation in in action in daily life as an easy transition with simple movements. And so one is seeing um, also some yogas be, that are that are suitable for us as beginning practitioners. That was a sort of long answer. I hope that was that's helpful. Very much so. Thank okay. you. I had a buddy of mine tell me um, in a discussion about the Rechung Kaju. He said, "Oh, it's gone," and I was really disappointed because uh, Rechung was kind of cool uh, from the whole shepherd boy story on. <laughs> yeah. um, I found online a apparently a Nyingma Tolku in Vancouver, and the name is gone right now, I'd need my phone to find it, uh, that holds like some, I don't know anything, something called the Northern Treasure Lineage. John which, mm -hmm. Okay, so y'all know that. And Rechung Kaju, but he's Nyingma. Mm. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. So I was wondering, could you maybe talk a little bit about the Rechung Kaju and like why, did, why does my buddy think it's lost? What happened? Um, I, I, do you know? Um, well, I do know that it's, you know, Rachel is a special speciality at the Sermon Monastery, Sermon Kargyu Monasteries, that they actually emphasize his lineage, and his lineage is considered still alive, and it's called, you know, the sort of, however you want to translate, you know, whispered lineage or oral lineage of Rechungpa, and it's one of the living lineages. I have no idea how many people practice only that, um, but it's it's definitely not lost. I wouldn't say it's lost at all, you know. But it's there's so many options <laughs> that. Uh, but that's what I know about it. And um, uh, I've been looking at the Sermong monasteries because of the church, you know, because of the f focus on church, and and found that that's that's mm -hmm. who they claim. I read that history that Marcus got me of the. A Tibetan history of Sermong monasteries, and mm. that's their champion, you know, Rei Chungpa. It's their guy. It's their man. So, <laughs> yeah, this is, I think, um, true of you know. I said the of the other karma kaju, like we talked about the four greater and eight lesser. That um, the, you know, I was trying to 
not get distracted, like keep a streamline coming through, but it doesn't mean that the transmissions of their teachings have died out completely. So, um, but if particularly um, in most of the, m most Kaju monasteries in Tibet are in Eastern Tibet. And in them they have, um, you know, preserved many, many teachings and lineages, but of course, there has been a big break, and you know some of these were able came with teachers out of Tibet, um, and they passed them on, and some have continued them on in Tibet. But of course, this is a time when you know many things were were almost lost. Many things seem to be lost, um, and so there's been a, you know a lot of focus on just trying to preserve, and you you start somewhere, you know, and you start with major lineages often. Karma Kaju has been working very hard and, you know, we've seen a great deal of progress in that, you know, over the last, for me, 40 years. And texts we thought were completely lost, texts that were that we thought were lost and completely unavailable to us, um, you know, even 15 years ago, well, we have them now, you know, you can go find them online. So. Um, and the, and and there are also these uh, the transmissions may still be being given, but only to a few people, just to keep them alive, because there's a big focus on just trying to do the the major work. It was very popular for a while to say that the Jonang had totally disappeared, uh, mm -hmm. and I was fighting that tooth and nail. Had to do that for years. Some of people who you probably know said that in their books, and. Uh, it was completely not true. And it was because everybody's studies were based on central Tibet. Yeah. And you know whatever happened in central Tibet supposedly happened in Tibet. Because actually, <laughs> Tibetans only call, cent to, their word for Tibet is only applies to central Tibet, and Kham is a whole other country, as far as they're concerned in the east. And Amdo is even more <laughs> another country, which by the way doesn't have Kargyu. Hardly at all. Yeah, that's right. In yeah. Amdo, I wasn't thinking of them. When yeah, I said they Eastern's don't. Uh, yeah, yeah there's right. Jonang and, and Galupa really, and Nyingma, and that's it. But um, so a lot, you know, as they say, whoever writes the histories gets to say the thing. So I'm glad that finally some of these things have been cleared up. You know, that the Jonang has been very vibrant, if not like burgeoning, in Eastern Tibet now, and the Chinese are behind it. And um, I think the Beichung lineage has just been kept more quiet, but I think, I'm pretty sure it's there, but it would be interesting to, yeah. definitely be interesting to seek it out. You should yeah. do that. Yeah. Field yeah. work. Yeah. And it is, I, I think when I first, you know, met Kala Rinpoche and the Shangba Kaju, of course I was so young, I didn't really even appreciate, like, when you heard the story of, you know, jump gun control, gathering the teachings and reviving yeah, yeah. them, but you don't really appreciate it until it's listening yeah. to you now. And I was That's thinking, amazing. it really is amazing. Um, it really is taking one of the eight practice lineages that wasn't being um, practiced yeah. very much and reviving it. It's a huge revival. It is so a huge revival. A lot has to do with what gets institutionalized. Uh, and that's why you get those four schools, because they've been very institutionalized in yeah. Tibet with m multiple monastic complexes. And these other ones, like Shangpa and um, you know, some of the others just didn't get the buildings <laughs> permit. And so they're, pra they're real practice lineages, and s rather than schools, you could say, or uh, power politics aren't involved or anything like that. So you'll find out in the morning, because I'm working on one that really is just about disappeared, but it's not. The CJ, you know, that, uh, so. It's also why translation can be so important because what does get translated does, not all of it, of course, <laughs> does get attention. Yeah. You know, going back to your um, Tibetan Book of the Dead, the yeah. Bardo Tudor, a, a totally story? obscure book that it everybody's is. read. And so it's why it's very important to translate the key texts, um, the ones that really were, uh, were being, you know, are carrying the transmissions through them and um, have them available to people because then they can, like the Shangba Kaji can be practiced. So. 
So we're going to pass the hat for that translators. Here you go. Oh, wait. That's not <laughs> I wanted to uh, explore a little bit more uh, what you were saying about um, the special tradition of uh, root guru and uh, devotion in the uh, Kagyu. And in particular, I was thinking about Milarepa having um, the Maitripa and Naropa, I mean, very... Marpa. Marpa, Marpa sorry. Yeah. Marpa, two M's. Marpa and Maitripa, two very different people. And yet, I'm sure he had a special relationship with each, eh? So I think there's a tendency, um, maybe it's just in Boulder, <laughs> um, <laughs> to think of Root Guru as a singularity. And um, I'm hoping it's not. <laughs> Why would it be? Big pardon? Why would it be? I. I don't know, actually. Well, you know, I think there's a difference. I mean, it has to look at, um, when we take the examples of Tilopa or Naropa or Marpa or Miller, Gumboba, all these you know, extraordinary people as our examples, I have to remember they were extraordinary people. So our lives may not, you know, we may not be able to practice like Millerepa. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you can, but. Um, so we have to look at like who we are and what we can do. And so just because Marpo is able to form that kind of relationship with that number of teachers, I may not be able to. I may need to have one teacher because I'm a much slower and plodding person. And again, we have to look at where we are and at what time it is during our past. So in the beginning when we're learning and, and everything is new and we really know nothing and it's just you know, a whole sea of teachings of different methods, we don't, I can speak for myself, I wouldn't know how to put them together. I do need you know, a teacher to guide and say like this and you do this and you do that and you try it and you see how it works and you know, if it doesn't seem to be fitting you, you might then drift off into like something else which is more congenial to you. Right. And still, at the same time, might not have met someone who really, like, you feel like you really got it from. Or the first person you meet, might you might have that connection. Or you just might, it might develop really, really, really slowly over time, like decades. Um, so you have to then differentiate. I'm not saying everybody should run out and meet every wonderful teacher who comes, you know, I mean, through Boulder, you've got so many, you know, like, because... And I mean, maybe that shows you the nature of your mind and you go like that. You know, you it's great. But for many people, it's, that won't be a way to deepen on the path. Does this make sense? Yeah, it does, because you're um, focusing on our own experience rather than the teacher. And I think there's a tendency to look at the qualities of the teacher versus the qualities of the relationship. And, the, and our own qualities, where we yeah. are on the path, too. I mean, it's about, it's, it's both, right? So it's not just that we're an open, eager, dedicated student. We also have to find the teacher that sort of matches for us. They have to be open, eager, and dedicated. Whatever, you know, all the qualities, they both have to be there. It's like a contract, like on both sides. But at the same time, you have to do a lot of preparation for it. And I think that's what I was trying to emphasize about, you know, Tilopa, it's 12 years in chains, right? And then, you know, Naropa being a pandita and all the work that Marpa went through. And Kampopa, he was, you know, very educated. Same with, um, I didn't, forgot to mention, with Pamodrupa. One of Gampopa's main students was a, a studying the Sakya tradition and was a very esteemed teacher in that tradition. And then he met Gampopa quite late, I think in both their lives, but particularly, um, so, and that was his root guru. And now he's part of the, you know, Kaju tradition. And he had, you know, so there's a lot, a lot that can go into, into your path before you even meet your root guru, possibly. 
Can I add something? Yeah, please. I, I think <clears throat> our culture, really, we don't have a paradigm for this idea of devotion. Uh, so we pretty much get it wrong, usually. I mean, we really don't have any, except for occasionally in uh, academic situations where you have a mentor. But that's not even really close. And I think a lot of people bring their what we do have here, which is uh, rock stars and Hollywood stars, and you know, there's, there's, we really don't. So that's this is why there's a lot of confusion about it. And in terms of this, if whether we have one or not, I mean, I, I sometimes wonder if our, if the Christian background emphasis on um, marital monogamy has an influence. Like he's, you know, met the love of my life, Kala Rinpoche, and that's it. You know, I, I just wonder about it, because I really, uh, and in Asia, there's many, many, they have a whole completely different attitude, especially towards deference. And, you know, it's not that you sign your life away. <laughs> you know, they, they're able to have deference and respect for a teacher without kind of going completely crazy and giving up all independence and power, whereas I people, because they're not quite sure how it works with a teacher, sometimes do that. They just are like, I'm completely, you know, I'm a slave now. And I don't think that's, I don't think that's a fair reflection of the Tibetan um, system where devotion is so very important. And maybe it was important in tantric, uh, in Hinduism as well, I don't know. Anyway, that's just my I agree. Yeah, I mean that's a, on it. <laughs> that's a difference in cultures. Yeah. Um, and loyalty and humbleness mm -hmm. and all those things we don't really have good uh, examples of things like that. We just have it sort of theoretical or something. And sometimes when we asked um, teachers about it, we may misunderstand even how, what they say. Um, so I think it's. Is something you know you have to. It's like anything else, any kind of relationship. You know, you you make mistakes and you learn from them. And mm -hmm. um, but I think we have to also differentiate between types of teachers that we have. So the Lama we take refuge from. We might that might be the person from who we do have the closest connection to, but it might not be. And that's there's nothing wrong with that. That's. This, this is normal. This is how it's practiced. Um, and at the same time, if we want to make progress on anything, if you want to, you, you have to concentrate. You have to focus. Um, so going around and meeting every single teacher of every single lineage, you might, m that might be your path, but it, but it might not be. You know, you might be fooling yourself. So then you pick something and you work with it, and then you find if it does work or doesn't work, and you can shift, and all of that's how we progress along. But we also have to take responsibility for that. Yeah, um. I guess. <laughs> You must. <laughs> only, only to sort of illustrate what you've been talking about. Um, I remember I asked um, uh, Atta Rinpoche in Cambridge about, you know, I thought I had to find a root guru right at the beginning. And he said, um, he said, if a tree has any one root, it won't stand up. Hmm. <laughs> so you have to have many roots, gurus. Hmm. And... Uh, Basically, I think he was saying that you should come, you know, snap out of this feeling that you have to find some special relationship, uh, you know, as a kind of working basis for the your know, practice, which is it's not so, especially in the beginning. On the other hand, uh, in as I gradually sort of got more familiar with the in the Nyingma tradition, um, they would, you know, that they would say exactly the same thing. On the other hand. Uh, I had an uh, interesting instruction on this from uh, Nyingma Lama, who said that um, the root guru is the person who can place, as you said, place you in the nature of your mind. And of course, uh, that's a very special relationship. But it may not happen in this life. The root, the root guru 
is moving towards you just as you are moving towards him but it may take many lives for this to happen and what it what it is is in fact the 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 appearance of the uh, the appearances of the dharma in one's experience is actually a kind of echo to something that is happening inside namely the the clarifying the removing of obscurations from one's own buddha nature and when that buddha nature is clear the root guru is there it's the same and there's a there's also another which sort of goes in parallel with this idea of mugu or, or devotion uh, and actually devotion um, however one wants to, of course we feel we know what it means when we use the word devotion but the word devotion ne doesn't necessarily convey everything that mugu has but we still you know we have to find something but basically Yes, it's to do, I mean, it means reverence, it means uh, veneration and so forth. But the main thing is that uh, devotion is what makes possible the transmission of blessing. It's, it opens the mind to make it uh, receptive to uh, the Dharma. So you can have devotion not just to a person, but you can have devotion to the, the three jewels or the, the teaching, the books, you know. And this kind of... Uh, where you kind of prize the thing so much and and you are drawn towards it with this kind of interest and steady uh um how to say kind of you know uh constancy constancy to, of, of interest and uh, and um, desire I, I was interested by your translation of egoless longing which i think in some ways captures very very well the this idea i think that's from trung Rinpoche. Yeah. Or so I'm told by one of his students. Yeah. yeah. And there's this famous story of uh, Atisha, who was visiting Tibet, and uh, some uh, monk came to him and said, give me a blessing. And Atisha said, show me devotion. And he didn't, he didn't mean that if you show me devotion as a reward, I'll give you a blessing. He meant that if you have devotion, that is the blessing. It will, always, it will come. <coughs> The, the teacher and the student are joined by uh, the blessing of the teacher and the devotion of the student. So that's what I picked up from it. And there's also the four types of gurus. And so when we hear, typically we think of a guru as a, you know, a human being um, but in uh, so Ocean of Definitive Meaning, Wang Chuk Dorje lists four types of gurus, and the first one is a guru who is a holder of a lineage as a human being, and that is who we encounter first, and typically what we need first. Um, we need to be see somebody else living and experiencing the teachings and talk to them and whatever. But um, he also says that there are three, three other ways that we experience a guru and one second one is as the words of the Buddha or the teachings so through reading books and so you know you could say that if you well I'll go through all four um, and the third is uh, symbolic appearances or appearances manifesting to us as symbols of the teachings so the phenomenal world teaching us. That can be tricky too, but anyway. And the fourth is the nature of our own mind. So when we can see the nature of our mind, that is our teacher. And that can be tricky too, because if you think you do and you don't, and you, and you could be deceiving yourself. So that is typically why we start with a human being, because human beings also give relationship. There's maybe some you know, checks and balances in there, but, once we, um, but we should really understand what is meant by a guru and the role of a guru through, through looking at these four different modes of a, for us to have a guru. 